Good morning. And welcome. Get all my things together here. First, let me mention that Tommy is out of town, and Pastor Tim asked me to fill in for him since the first announcement is from the Pastor Search Committee. Um, church business, please note that Pastor call schedule that is in your insert again this Sunday um, that we discussed last Sunday church business meeting is this Wednesday April 10th at 6 p.m. that will be real important for everybody to come I hope that you will um, on the back uh, side of the insert please fill out the reservation form for dinner if you plan to attend and drop it in the offering plate or leave it in the church office after worship at the business meeting, you will receive a narrative resume about our candidate and her experience in pastoral ministry. We will discuss the prospective pastor job description and uh, salary package. And you will hear from each of the search team members individually. We have three Meet the Pastor events. And please attend one of those so that you will have a chance to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her. The first meeting will be Friday, April 12th at 6 p.m. This will be for families with children and youth. Pizza will be provided for dinner. The second meeting will be Saturday, April 13th at 10 a.m. This meeting will be for deacons, active and inactive, choir members and spouses. There'll be biscuits for breakfast. The third meeting will be Saturday, April 13th at 1230 for everyone else, and sandwiches are for lunch. Next Sunday, there will be a Q&A with the candidate in the fellowship hall during the Sunday school beginning at 930 a.m., and there will be donuts for breakfast. You can see we have food for all the meetings, so there's no reason not to show up. During worship, the candidate, will, the candidate will preach and lead the worship service. The church, uh, after that, will vote by secret ballot, and that will take, uh, take place immediately after worship. If you have any questions, you can see me after worship. I'll be glad to address those. That's the big uh, thing for this coming week. Please also note that the deacons will meet immediately after worship in the chapel. This is our quarterly long meeting. And I can assure you it won't be long. Uh, I've got that wrapped up. should be about 20 minutes. Uh, Monday morning Bible study will meet tomorrow, April 8th at 11, I mean, excuse me, at 10 a.m. in the ladies' parlor. Lunch will be at Papa Joe's beginning at 11.15. We are pleased to welcome the Reverend Dr. Wayne Wyke as our guest preacher today. Dr. Wyke has served several Baptist congregations in North Carolina retiring as the pastor of First Baptist Laurenburg. Previously, he served the Baptist State Convention of North Carolina as the Executive Director of Christian High, Higher Education and Wingate University as the Dean for Church Relations. Wayne continues to minister in his retirement, serving congregations as an interim pastor. He and his wife, Debbie, have three adult children and six grandchildren, which includes two sets of twins. Please welcome Dr. White to the First Baptist pulpit today. Thank you. Also with us today is Nancy Robinson. Nancy is the pianist for Morven Presbyterian Church twice a month. We are pleased that she could be with us today and lead us in, lead us in worship. Nancy, welcome to First Baptist. And finally, allow me to call your attention to the flowers on the communion table, which are given to the glory of God and in memory of Virginia Baker, given by her sons, Glenn and Ken Calder, on the fourth anniversary of her going to be with the Lord. Now, if, you'll, if you would like, you can join me as I read Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. 
He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor asleep, nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time and forevermore. Now for the invocation prayer, and then once I finish my part, you can join me for the Lord's Prayer. Please bow your heads. Dear Lord, allow us to open our hearts and minds as we hear your word on this beautiful day you have gifted us. Let us hear these words, and by your actions, allow us to share them with our friends, our family, and with strangers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now if you'll turn to your hymn, in your hymnals to the hymn of commitment number 13, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. It's a pleasure and honor to be back with you today to share in worship. I'm grateful for Pastor Tim for the invitation to come be with you today, as well as to be with you the last Sunday of this month and a few Sundays next month. I was listening to the announcements with great interest. Boy, things are beginning to happen in a very serious way here in the church. I'm so pleased to hear the announcement about a potential calling of a pastor that's a new day a new chapter in the life of this church, and I trust it will be a real happy and glorious day for this church. So I will join my prayer with yours for God's direction in these coming days. Today is referred to as Low Sunday in the life of the church. Low in the sense that it's the Sunday after Easter, and it's the week that a lot of children are out of school and families are 
taking much needed vacations and away. And of course, attendance at church is low today. One of my pastor friends referred to Low Sunday as the Sunday in which all associate pastors are called upon to fill the pulpit on Low Sunday. I'm not the associate pastor, but I understand those things. And I'm grateful that you're here today. We have come together for worship. And prayer is one of the most significant parts of our experience of worship. Join with me now as we pray. Our Father, it was just a week ago we gathered in this place to worship you and to celebrate the victory Christ experienced over the grave. We come with that same gladness of heart, recognizing that we are Easter people, people who believe in a risen Savior, people who rejoice that death is but a passageway into a life far greater and grander than anything we have experienced here today. So hear us as we continue to shout out the hallelujahs, to voice the amens, acknowledging the gladness of our spirit and heart, knowing that as your people, we have a message to share and to share it with one and with all. Gather us together today, dear God, through the presence of your spirit. Bring a sense of oneness and unity among us as we night unite in recognizing that Christ is the centerpiece of who we are and what we're about, reading his words and accepting his words as being the words of life and truth. May they empower us not only for the living of this day, but for the facing of the new tomorrows. And how I pray, O oh Father, for this your church as it embarks upon a very significant decision regarding the calling of a new shepherd to come and to lead this church into those new tomorrows. How we pray for the candidate and how we pray for this fellowship as together they come seeking your spirit's direction. How grateful we are, dear God, for saints of days past who have brought this church to this point and assuming the roles and responsibilities of those who are part of this fellowship as they prepare for the coming generations. Hear us, dear God, as we seek to be people of faith and promise, knowing, O oh God, that Jesus said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So it is his name we voice our prayer and offer this offering of worship this day. Bless it, we pray. In Christ's holy name, amen. May we unite by singing our next hymn on 107, Love Live to Me.
Good morning and top of the day to you. How's everybody doing today? Y'all have a big Easter? I know you didn't get any candy, did you? Okay. Huh? See how honest you're going to be this morning. Well, let me ask you a question. Do y'all like to color? Good, good. Now, um, when I was young and I tried to color, it wasn't that good. For some reason, I just made poor choices. You know, like, here's a picture of something from, from Paw Patrol, right? Now, if, if I colored his face in, I decided I'm going to color that face in green. Does that look right? No, but you could do it, couldn't you? Well, that's because we made a choice to color it green. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It may not be just the right color. Now, if we used brown, that'd probably look better, wouldn't it? We know life's a lot like a coloring book. Sometimes we make choices that aren't the best in the world, but we 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 learn when we make them that maybe I shouldn't have done you know colored his face green it would look better brown or if I colored his ears pink hmm, that wouldn't look right either would it would on you I think I colored your ears pink this afternoon Cal how about that you learn that anyway. That's why I said, I, I brought y'all some coloring books and crayons, and so I know when it's a quiet time and you want to do something, you want some color, think about when you're coloring, the choices that, that you make, the colors that you choose, that as you grow older and you start making choices in life, uh, especially when you get into your early teens, you'll be making some really big choices in life, and you want to make sure that you choose the right color, okay? And so, so now is the time to start thinking about when you make choices in life, that you make the right choices, okay? All right, so let's have a word of prayer, and then I'll give you the books and crayons. Dear Heavenly Father, how we thank you for these kids today and the life that we have ahead of them, and that we stand behind them, with them, and we'll carry them through as best we can as, as adults. And we know that you have them, Lord. And we're so grateful for you for that. But we ask that you grant them good decision-making skills as they grow. And they'll make good choices. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Here we are, here we are. Any adults, want, would you like to tell them book? It takes courage to do what we just witnessed. Years ago, I tried my hand at doing a children's sermon. And afterwards, my wife came up to me and said, don't ever do that again. <laughs> and I haven't. But I do admire those who have that gift and ability. Our passage today comes from John's Gospel, the 20th chapter, verses 19 through 23. When therefore it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus 
therefore said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father had sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. But if you retain the sins of any, they've been retained. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today, I'd like to ask you to join with me in thinking about an experience that's common to all of us. I'm talking about the experience of fear. It really doesn't matter who we are, what our credentials may be, what our background may be, and any other metric we might be able to cite to identify who we are, what we're about, etc. All of us 
at some time or the other will experience fear in our life and that fear may be modest such as fearing what the weather will be like tomorrow but then it can be far more significant that fear that grips your life when you await the test results for your recent visit with your physician knowing if they come back as you fear your life could be changed in the matter of just a few quick diagnoses. Fear is never welcomed and it's never wanted by any of us. And if truth be known, we wish we could live our life free of fear no matter how it packages itself or presents itself in the course of our life. And if we were to stop and ask ourselves when those moments of fear become particularly strong and forceful in our life, why am I experiencing so much fear at this particular moment? I have a feeling at the end of that kind of self-diagnosis, we probably would end up saying part of my heaviness over this experience of fear is because of the uncertainties that I'm facing. Because if truth be known, we'd like life to be neat, clean, and packaged, and programmed, where things just would kind of flow along without any kind of interruptions or calamities. But life is not that way, is it? Life can indeed be very messy, if truth be known, and very unpredictable. And so when life throws us those curveballs of fear, however it may package itself, present itself to us, we find ourselves having to deal with it, trying to cope with it, hoping that it will not take such a grip on our life that it leaves us paralyzed and immobile. I'm saying all this to dive into our passage today. For you see, it was just last Sunday. We came together as the people of faith and celebrated the risen Christ. And what a glorious day Easter was for all of us. Resurrection Sunday, that day in the calendar which reminds us once more that we're people of hope, that we have a promise that has been made to us because of our faith and confidence in Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, that whether our days be measured in few or plenty, that there is a life beyond and how grateful we are that we are an Easter people. But notice, if you will, John tells us how the disciples of Jesus, having witnessed the resurrection of Christ, are huddled together inside closed doors, gripped by fear and they had every right to be fearful for you see just a few days earlier they had witnessed our Lord being tried, convicted and crucified an innocent blameless individual and yet they witnessed such cruelty and brutality being leveled against the very Son of God. You're getting the idea, aren't you? They had every reason to be fearful for their lives, thinking, well, if this could happen to Jesus, surely it could happen to us. If we suddenly go out and boldly declare that we're followers of Jesus, that same fate could very easily come our way. So what did they do? They hid themselves 
behind closed doors. That's a big piece that I hope you'll hang on to in our passage today and allow it to become a metaphor for where many of us are living our lives today that is living our lives behind closed doors. Doors that have been locked shut, bolted shut, thinking if we can be behind those closed doors, we'll be in a safe place. Because those fears that had inhibited our lives have caused us to seek a safe place, a place of comfort, a shelter, a sanctuary, if you will. But huddled behind those closed doors, as safe and protected as the disciples considered themselves to be, notice how Jesus appears. And as he appears among them, what did he tell them? He said, peace be with you. Oh, how we need to hear those words. We need to hear those words as so Jesus is standing before us this very day, looking into each of our eyes and speaking to each one of our hearts and says to us, peace be with you. For beloved, I do not know you as much as I wish I did. But I am convinced that there are some, if not many among us, who indeed are like these frightened disciples, are living their life behind some closed doors, seeking safety, protection. And for that reason, I first of all want you to consider the grip of fear and how fear, when it grips our life, can indeed leave us immobile, paralyzed, unable to function. The 1930s in our nation's history was a very troubled time, maybe even more troubled and unsettled than the times we're living in today. In 1933, when Theodore Roosevelt delivered his inaugural address to the nation, he offered those prophetic words that are as true today as they were in 1933 when he said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Prophetic. He did not claim to be a theologian, philosopher, but he spoke a word of clarity and truth as he acknowledged that indeed fear, how it can come in and grip our lives and leave us unable to do what we're capable of doing. If a voice named John Madden, many of you will recognize the name as a great hero in professional sports. A big, bulky hulk of a man who played professional football, who coached professional football, and then was a broadcaster of professional football. If ever anybody personified a man who lived his life absent of fear, you would think Madden was the one, would you not? Not so. You see, Madden had an intense fear of flying. So much so that he had to use a motor coach to get from one site to another site for each week's game. Someone asked him, what's the story behind this fear of flying? He said, one day I was in the airport. Yeah was in the airport and you know how they have these kiosks where you can buy flight insurance I was standing in line to buy some and I looked ahead and there were three pilots buying insurance as well 
I'm assuming he was being clever or witty, but the point nevertheless, that fear of flying had gripped his life, that he changed his life and learned to live with that fear instead of conquering it. Do you know what you're fearful of today? Do you know the reason behind that fear, where it's manifesting itself in your life today? These disciples, John doesn't tell us this, but using our spiritual imagination, it's almost as though we can hear John telling us these disciples were very troubled, fearful, yes, but also anxious because if ever there was an uncertain time in their life, now was the moment. They thought they had entered into the unknown earlier when Jesus reached out to each one of them and individually invited them to become one of his disciples. They left family, friends, jobs, and a host of other responsibilities to suddenly go and follow Jesus. And having followed him and then suddenly seeing what has happened to their Lord, certainly they were facing tomorrow's filled with such great uncertainty. But beloved, while fear can grip our lives, we can also overcome fear. It may not be easy. It may not be as easy as taking an aspirin to help us with a headache. But if we acknowledge if we acknowledge what's causing this anxiety and fear in our life, there is an opportunity for us to channel fresh energy to address it, and good things can actually come out. Louis Pasteur was a man who was gripped by fear. He had an incredible fear, an irrational fear of dirt and infection so much so that he would not shake hands with individuals. As a result, he addressed the fear, if you will, and gave birth to pasteurization, as well as development of vaccines for things such as rabies and anthrax. And think of what a difference he made through that effort of acknowledging his fear of germs and infection, addressing it, channeling his creative energies, and creating healthy processes that affect every one of us in this room. So dream with me for a moment, beloved. Dream with me as we think about those fears in our life that are holding us back, gripping us. And think with me, if we were to take the model of Louis Pasteur and suddenly begin addressing those and allowing good to come out of those experiences, what a difference we could make in our life and the life of others. Helmut Tillichy a German pastor who stood in the rubble of his bombed out church in Berlin having escaped the wrath of Adolf Hitler but standing in the ruins of the physical building that he had once led worship in delivered a sermon based upon the very passage we're studying today. And he said the key to this sermon or this passage were those four words Jesus voiced to those disciples. Peace be with you. Tillichy said those four words are words we need to 
hear and meditate upon because they really are transformative words insofar as how we live our life today and as we face those uncertain tomorrows. Martin Luther, the reformer of the church, in a similar way, said we dare not gloss over that reading of the passage peace be with you without allowing them to kind of roll around in our mind and hearts allowing them to take root peace be with you yes I do believe we're living in a very anxious time, in a very uncertain time, so much so that some of us would prefer not even reading the morning newspaper or watching the evening news. But the same Jesus who said to those disciples, peace be with you, is saying those words to each one of us here today. hear them and allow them to take root in our life we can open doors that have been closed because of people finding it more convenient to stay behind closed doors instead of experiencing the wonder of life you know COVID really through the church for Luther we're still suffering as a result of that experience. Even today, I will hear people say, I haven't gone back to church since the shutdown because I'm just fearful. Okay. I get it. But it's time, beloved, for the people of God to reach out and to encourage people to come and to be a part of the family of God, to help them overcome those fears and experience the wonder and the majesty of God's holy presence as God's people come together to worship him and to honor him. I saw a meme on Facebook a few months ago that I think is one of the most profound <laughs> memes I've ever seen. one that pictured an electronic fire in a fireplace and the caption read you can look at that fire all day long and never feel heat by extension saying if it were a real fire you could feel the heat you could smell the embers as they were burning and saying by extension when people come together for worship, instead of staying home and watching TV on YouTube or Facebook or TV or some other media, they may be viewing a worship, but not really feeling it, not really experiencing it. And I can't help believe when Jesus said to those disciples, peace be with you he was trying to do more than just settle, settling their nervousness their uncertainty in many ways I think Jesus was seeking to empower them look back at verse 21 read it slowly and carefully hear Jesus once more as he said to his disciples and as he's saying to us Peace be with you. The Hebrew word for peace is the word shalom. Shalom means much more than the simply absence of war or fighting. No, in the Greek thought, shalom means something speaking about wholeness and a completeness, a confidence that comes upon you and settles you 
and gives you that strength you need to face whatever tomorrow may bring. And I have to believe that was at the very heart of what Jesus was saying to those disciples. Yes, you saw what happened to me. He showed them his hands. He showed them his side. But in spite of that, he says, peace be with you. He was empowering them to go forward in the confidence that whatever tomorrow may bring, that they had shalom. They had comfort and confidence that Jesus would be with them as he was in that room behind a closed door. indebted to John recording this passage for our hearing today. We're indebted in that it reminds us that had Jesus not come among those disciples, they could very easily have surrendered themselves to their fear and said to themselves, if this happened to Jesus, I'm going back to my boat and I'm going to go fish. Jesus said, peace be with you. He gave them a blessing and a promise that they could go forward knowing that whatever life may throw their way, he will be with them. And he is with you. Each one of you is his children. So beloved, Accept the peace of God that passeth all understanding. Allow it to swell in you like yeast in fresh dough. For the glory of God and for the glory of his church. Amen. Join with me as we stand to sing a hymn of invitation on 434. May we stand. Fathers, we have gathered as your people. The time has come for us now to scatter and depart, to go back to our places of home, our places of responsibility. Going, dear God, empowered by the truth of your holy word, knowing, Father, that whatever this coming week may present, that we have the comfort and promise that you abide with us. Empower us, we pray, dear God, to be your people. In Christ's holy name we go.
Amen.